but um, I'd like to say good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us here for this special panel presentation and virtual book signing event. Uh, the support for these programs have been made possible by the Nancy Carol Draper Charitable Foundation as well as Sage Creek Ranch. Um, these sponsors really help make everything we do possible and we're also grateful to you, our audience, for your feedback and support for programs like the Lunchtime Expedition Program. Um, we are recording these lectures um, and uploading them to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous lectures from this year or the past couple of years, um, you can find them uh, by going to youtube.com, type in Draper Natural History Museum. You'll see our bear icon, uh, the same icon that's up there in the upper left of the, uh, the screen. Um, you can access our, our previous presentations from there. Uh, if you'd like to be added to the listserv, just send me an email. There'll be an a, a email address in our outro slide, um, but it's just coreya at centerofthewest.org. Um, so we've also started including links to our previous talks uh, when sending out emails to this listserv. Um, so it's another good reason to sign up. Uh, we are broadcasting today's presentation over Zoom webinar and simultaneously to Facebook Live. So at any time, um, feel free to submit your questions using Zoom's chat feature or Q&A feature or on the Facebook Live uh, chat um, box there, and we will relay your questions to our speaker panel um, at the end, uh, end of the presentation. Uh, today, we are really excited to host the Zorka Beartooth Wilderness Foundation with special guests Dan Tires and Shane Doyle, um, recipient of the Independent Publishers Book Award for Best Nonfiction in 2019 for the Rocky Mountain Region, and High Plains Book Award finalist, Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone, represents a significant and collaborative effort to celebrate the story of one of the most wild, pristine, and beautiful places on planet Earth. Um, a quick note, I'm gonna switch over the screen here. Um, you can uh, purchase a signed copy of Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone, um, a narrative atlas, by visiting the Points West Market. Uh, we, we will provide a link. There is currently a link in Zoom's chat feature where you can access this book um, and, and purchase a signed copy. So just follow that link and it'll bring you to this, uh, this web page where you can pick up a signed copy. Um, I'm going to switch back over here uh, momentarily. And so kicking off today's presentation is Trouty Perry. Trouty is co-editor for Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone a narrative atlas of the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness. She is at her best in the high mountain habitat of Pikas, and she's prone to long walks, skis, or rides with or without a particular destination. She worked for the U.S. Forest Service for over 31 years, most recently as the Beartooth District Ranger on the Custer Gallatin National Forest out of Red Lodge. Today, these days, you'll find Trouty volunteering on the fun stuff, like pounding nails on fire lookout restoration projects. So without further ado, Please give Trouty a warm welcome. Introduction. Um, and let me say that the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness Foundation is excited and really honored uh, to partner with the Draper Museum, a key player in conservation in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and beyond, on this virtual book signing event for Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone, a narrative atlas of the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness which is a 318, four and a half pound book of richly illustrated essays, and is also a fundraiser for the AB Wilderness Foundation. Of course, we had been looking forward to the in-person event originally scheduled, but in some respects, this format has prompted some creativity and I think we've made it worth your time. So thank all of you for joining us today. As with any good system, resiliency is key. And I did want to point out that this drawing is by one of the foundation's artists in residence, Jonathan Marquis. A little bit about what to expect today from our talk. Uh, my co-editor and contributing map editor, De Dr. Jesse Logan, will follow me and provide his perspective on the book and the cartography work that really is what sets this book apart. Um, next up will be uh, author, and U.S. Forest Service wildlife research biologist, Dr. Dan Tires, who demonstrated truly heroic support in providing samples based on his scientific work while weaving in the human element. And you'll find that his essays um, and his talk today are really well done. 
And to round out the panel, author and Crow tribal member, Dr. Shane Doyle, who is involved in everything from the National Native American Hall of Fame to ancient ice patch work, to producing inspiring works of music and opera. Um, permit me to provide just a little bit of background. I don't wanna go into the weeds, but you'll see why in a minute. And the idea for this book was generated by Jesse and I way back in 2016. So a three-year effort. Our concept was to create an exploration of the cultural and natural riches of this arresting landscape through engaging essays paired with richly illustrated maps. We connected through the AB Wilderness Foundation Board, and that was the beginning of a collaboration that expanded almost exponentially throughout the wider community. Um, you can see we have a community of contributors um, that was based on Jesse and I developing a table of contents we initially approached authors from around the communities of the AB Wilderness across disciplines from physical resources like geology, uh, glaciers, water, natural resources, everything from bears to flowers, and the human sense of place. But as we approached authors, they would ask, do you have a publisher? Well, no. And as we approached publishers, uh, do you have content? And uh, so we regrouped. Jesse uh, developed a beautiful base map, which we uh, uh, put on a website. And we developed some initial content, thanks to early contributors who believed in the project, and put it on a website to illustrate what we had in mind. And thus was our breakthrough, which um, I have to say was supported by donations. Our first donation was from Tippett Rise Foundation out of Fishtail, Montana. It's a world-class performing arts center. And, and uh, they funded a cartography contract, a substantial contract, a substantial gift to us. And as I said, our intention from the start was for the book to be a fundraiser. Therefore, even though we had interest from a couple of respected university or conservation presses, the return to the foundation would have been surprisingly minimal. So we reached out to potentially interested donors with these spectacular results, which allowed us to help hire help. Uh, Scott McMillian, our consulting editor and a well-known author himself. Adrian Pollard um, designed the book and made it beautiful. And the range of donors that are on this slide demonstrated the community aspect of this work. Um, the Grangers uh, are foremost our primary donors for both the first and the upcoming second printing. And what it has meant is that we were able to present the foundation with an inventory of books for them to sell with 100% return to the foundation. So we're very grateful to everyone. And now I should talk about the book. Um, and as Corey mentioned, there are signed copies available for order today through the museum. And the region covered by the book, the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness, is a magnificent primeval expanse of nearly 1 million acres of high altitude plateau, jewel-like lakes, cold streams, picturesque waterfalls, glaciers, permanent ice fields, and refugia for Arctic plants and animals, all at the northeast corner of Yellowstone, hence the name Capstone of Yellowstone. Notably, it's an intact ecosystem that contains nearly the full suite of predators and prey that existed at the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1805. As Jesse has noted, this is a landscape that does not need rewilding, it already is. Although this is an atlas complete with maps, it is not a good guidebook. Instead, in the way that wilderness users explore physical trails on the landscape, we'd like for readers to explore the intellectual trails that only begin with this atlas. My background is in engineering and science. Uh, um, we're not known for using the more intuitive languages of poetry or art, and yet I understand and appreciate the importance of art. The data may change our minds, but we need poetry to change our hearts, writes Robin Wall Kimmerer in Forest Under Story. We wanted this book to fire the imagination 
inspire a sense of connection, a sense of responsibility, and ultimately a sense of stewardship. So there are some themes that I want you to think about as we talk about the book. When we reached out for contributors to the Atlas, we were looking for stories that would be a joy for you to read with our writers unleashing their inner poets. We included essays you might expect on grizzlies and wolverines, but also species on the margins of human consciousness, such as fungi or Clark's nutcrackers. We originally had separate sections for the physical resources, geology, glaciers, water, the natural resources of flora and fauna, and the human sense of place, but that had to evolve. It's all intertwined. And we wanted to provide a sense or a voice for those who can't speak for themselves. These are a few images selected from this richly illustrated book. Another theme of the book that we hope to convey is not just the importance of designated wilderness and public lands, whether they're in your local park or national parks, but for both natural resources and humans, but also the interconnectedness of humans and wild places over time. Wilderness boundaries are necessary lines on the map, but they are a recent human construct. For most of human history, involvement in wilderness was a daily engagement. What does it mean both for wilderness and humans when we lose the connection? Boundaries just don't reflect the nature of these holistic systems. If wilderness is seen as separate, something that is not us, is there a danger that it becomes just another commodity, a backdrop to a workout? These essays are intended to show what's at risk when we draw a line around wilderness and expect that protection to be adequate as we become complacent. What is lost when we see it as separate? Also wanted to trace the ongoing evolution in our understanding of intact ecosystems perhaps revisit the notion that what's always been there will always be there. Honor those who've come before and those yet unborn. We have essays that illustrated the passing of knowledge from one generation to the next. And in one case, what Crow youth have to teach their non-native teacher who works hard at helping them maintain their connection to the land. The lower left is a picture of a Crow class after a mountain climbing trip with this non-native teacher. Ultimately, what drove the project is we had this in mind the whole time. If you don't capture the voices, all you end up with is whispers. Hank Ray um, was an important character in the book. Uh, he was the last district ranger for the old Stillwater Ranger District, which was absorbed into the Beartooth Ranger District in 1968, before he moved on and became a key player in the formation of the boundaries of this wilderness. This last slide, um, I want to say that this is an ongoing project through the website, which we started in 2017. We're going to get back to that now outdated website with more interesting technologies such as story maps and to fill in gaps that were, we identified in the book, stories we didn't yet capture, which is a good segue for me to introduce Dr. Jesse Logan, our story map developer and co-editor and contributing map editor for Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone. He is a recognized authority on the condition of Greater Yellowstone's white bark pine forests and the communities they support. After retiring in 2006 from a career in academia and the U.S. Forest Service, he continues research and advocacy for high elevation ecosystems of the greater Yellowstone. In summer, he has been a contract instructor for Yellowstone Forever and is a backcountry ski guide during winter. Thank you, Jesse. Working out of Cook City, Montana for Yellowstone ski tours and bear tooth powder guides. With that, I present Dr. Logan. Okie doke, thank you, Trouty. And uh, should see, uh, my screen. And, uh, you know, Trouty really provided a nice uh, introduction about the motivation for uh, the Atlas and the objectives, what we're uh, trying to do with it. What I'm going to talk about 
is the role that maps have played in this whole process. And the first thing uh, I really, I think we should uh, discuss is the, the use of the term narrative atlas, you know, and what do we mean by a narrative atlas? If you would uh, do a search, a Google search on uh, atlas and look at what Wikipedia has to say, it says this, an atlas is a collection of maps. Well, it's that, but clearly we had a lot more in mind. We were interested in the personal, cultural, and ecological stories of this landscape. And uh, so, as Trotty mentioned, we initially contacted people uh, who we, some of which we knew, some we didn't, who we felt were best qualified to tell these stories. And we really didn't know what to expect. We are asking people whose livelihood is based on their talent as writers, scientists, artists, photographers, to make a significant commitment, you know, out of their busy schedule to write uh, original articles, create original works of art, all at a time when we had no financial resources to compensate any of our contributors. And as I say, we just didn't know what to expect. As it turned out, the response was overwhelming. There was just, uh, there's such a commitment to this landscape and this place that people were anxious to contribute. So our question of, is anybody going to be willing to contribute became one of with, uh, one, uh, what, you know, we have all of this material, how are we going to put it all together? And we had in mind more than just an anthology, we really wanted a coherent story. And so inspired by writers like uh, Rebecca Solnit's use of maps as one way to facilitate a cohesive narrative, uh, we thought, well, you know, in my interest in cartography, is the use of maps as, uh, as a way to sort of provide a, a roadmap through this landscape and to introduce particular stories and provide a landscape-based stage to, to uh, tell the story of the ABWF. So the first map I'll, I'll talk about is one that's really continental in scale. Uh, this work was uh, is based on the work of C.V. Riley from 1874 about the Rocky Mountain locust and it's detailed in Jeffrey Lockwood's article, uh, The Cradle and Grave of the Rocky Mountain Locust. Uh, the, uh, the map has an area of continuous occupation, the breeding area, an area that occasionally these locusts would expand to in large numbers, and finally this huge area where vast numbers of locusts would uh, essentially uh, swarms of truly biblical proportion would uh, descend on the on the rangeland and if you ask most people what the most abundant animal was in pre-European North America they'd probably say bison and no question bison were truly uh, uh, magnificent uh, herds and uh, maybe between 20 and 30 million animals accounting for something like 21 million tons of biomass but what was really the most abundant animal was the Rocky Mountain locust, this organism. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the numbers were amazing, but swarms have been estimated at 12 trillion organisms. That's a 12 with 12, you know, followed by 12 zeros. And a biomass of something that exceeded bison, something on there 27 million tons. So the, the numbers were amazing. And uh, what happened when these vast numbers descended on, at the time, uh, early settlers uh, consumed crops and everything else. It was a true disaster. And uh, Riley was studying this at a time, uh, really an unsettled time in this region he was working in. And you think of 1874 as two years before Custer went down at the Little Bighorn. So, you know, he was, uh, he was an interesting character for sure, but something else that's just as amazing as the locusts themselves is the fact that in uh, a matter of just a few decades after Riley's work, they became extinct, totally extinct, no more. 
And this is the story that Jeffrey tells in his uh, essay. He was hired in the early 1980s at the University of Wyoming as a grasshopper uh, to study grasshoppers. But this question was so fascinating to him, the scientific issues behind it, how could he resist? And the first question is, you know, was, is this animal truly extinct? There was a thought at the time that another uh, species, Melanopus sanguinopus, uh, a common grasshopper pest, was really the non-migratory stage of the Rocky Mountain locum, locust. So the, the first question Jeffrey had to ask was this, you know, is it extinct? And that brings up a real problem. How do you study an extinct organism? Well, the answer was found in places that uh, like Grasshopper Glacier up on the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness. As, uh, as grasshoppers, uh, and as it turns out, swarms of locusts fly over the mountains that become chilled when they uh, fly over these uh, glaciers, fall down on the ice, become entombed, and with glacial warming, uh, they become exposed. So Jeffrey started his search in the Absaroka Beartooth looking for specimens of this species that's been extinct for, you know, well over 100 years and uh, found large numbers of them and was able to establish that, yes, this organism was a completely different species that became extinct over a relatively short period of time. And uh, Jeffrey's detail, uh, essay details this fascinating story, but also the lessons that might be learned from it for another uh, currently super abundant organism, and that's us. It's interesting that Jeff started off in uh, entomology. He's now a member of the philosophy department, so he's well-founded to uh, explore things pretty broadly. Another uh, map that is of continental scale is the story that Nate Schwiebert tells about trout and trout colonization of the Absaroka Beartooth. If you think you've, you know, had a hard day, consider the cutthroat trout. You know, all trout origin is the Pacific Ocean. So to reach the Beartooth, uh, the migration route was up the Columbia River, then down the Snake, over the Continental Divide, down the uh, Yellowstone, over the falls, and finally, to the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness. If we take a little bit closer look, you see they go, uh, you know, through Yellowstone Lake, over the two falls, down the Lake Fork of the Yellowstone, and finally up the uh, streams that uh, have their source, headwater source, in the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness. But all these streams at some point have barriers. So in fact, most of the lakes found in the Beartooth uh, pre-European uh, experience were fishless, but they didn't remain that way for long. Uh, you know, a very uh, ambitious stocking program occurred early on after European contact uh, with little thought to the ecological uh, consequences of our guidance and, it, you know, with truly devastating consequences. It was the typical story of hybridization of native cutthroat trout with introduced rainbows and the, the degradation of the gene pool, and also being outcompeted by introduced brook trout. So uh, by mid last century, the fishery up on the Beartooth was really in pretty sad state. But the story doesn't end here, uh, due primarily to the efforts of one inspired and dedicated individual not only was there a reversal in what was going on with a native uh, cutthroat population, the Yellowstone cutthroat shown here, uh, but also uh, the formerly fishless lakes and streams of the wilderness have become some of the healthiest and most diverse in the entire West. So the story that Nate tells is one of degradation, yes, but it's also one of redemption. And it's a complex and fascinating story and includes a rich cast of characters uh, that uh, is uh, really uh, uh, a fun read. The next, uh, the map I point out is centered directly in the Absaroka Beartooth Granite Peak. Uh, the highest point in Montana is within the 
uh, AB wilderness. And in fact, all of the peaks in Montana greater than 12,000 feet are found in the uh, Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness, but Granite Peak being the highest is really the crown jewel. And in Doug McCarty's uh, essay, Strange Music, he tells a remarkable story of the first successful winter ascent of the opposing north face of granite on New Year's Eve, 1972. Let me go back here. Uh, north face of granite is no cakewalk even in midsummer, but a midwinter ascent is something else altogether, particularly considering it was accomplished by two high school students. Doug had just finished school, high school the previous summer, and by today's standards, uh, they were woefully ill-equipped and inexperienced. As Doug writes, uh, there was only the barest margins and no room for mistakes. Uh, so this is really a, a truly uh, harrowing story. And uh, to gain some appreciation of uh, just what this landscape is like, as Trotty mentioned, uh, developed a story map. You can uh, call it up on this link. And the kind of cool thing about this is, if you go to the story map, then you uh, come up with maps that you can uh, interact with. So to get a sense of what the North Face really looks like, you can go and explore it to some extent and follow along with Doug's article as uh, they approach uh, the North Face. The East Ridge plays a prominent role. And again, the, uh, the daunting winter ascent of this face. You can also gain a good uh, sense of just how rugged this landscape really is. Anyhow, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's one, it's fun, and two, it helps uh, as you read along with the article. So it's, uh, it's kind of neat. Um, the, uh, and we have, you know, 30 maps introducing 30 essays. Uh, so uh, the Yellowstone's capstone indeed is a collection of maps, but it's also much more. Our intent really is to produce this narrative atlas that includes these compelling stories, all, all of which are uh, well worth your time and interest to read, beautifully laid out by Adrian Pollard and to provide a spatial context for these individual voices, but most importantly, providing an introduction to the essays about this remarkable landscape and the equally remarkable events and people uh, that have occurred there, including uh, this example, uh, High Basin, High Basin's the story of uh, the last uh, uh, sheep in the mountain uh, in the wilderness by uh, Dr. Dan Tires and who is going to take over in just a second. Dan has been an important part of this landscape for the past 40 years, essentially his entire adult and professional life. And I can't think of anyone who understands this landscape better than Dan. He is currently grizzly bear habitat coordinator for the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And in this capacity is responsible for coordinating grizzly management among five national forests and other federal and state agencies. So with no further ado, Dan, take it away. Jesse, thank you for that gracious introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this forum and in this book, Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone. I appreciate being able to lend my voice and my stories to the celebration of the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness. In truth, we're here to celebrate a landscape that inspires us. And the best way to accomplish this is to tell a story. This book is a collection of stories from different perspectives, but all focus on a central theme, a remote landscape rich with stories of natural history and human history. And in truth, in the human condition, there are few things more compelling to us than a well-told story. My voice, my story, my part in this narrative began in 1978, the year this wilderness was established. 
and I have to confess that the symbolism of this was entirely lost on me. I had no aspirations to become part of something greater than myself, to participate in the fledgling wilderness movement. I don't remember any particular noble moments. I just wanted a good horse and good country. I wanted to move from academia to adventure as quickly as possible in that station of life. I started in 1978 and I stayed on those trails for more than three decades. I just got swept up in it all. And I did have many good saddle horses and unexpectedly through it all, one particularly good mule, a big roan named Molly with lots of personality. Maybe that was the best way for me to begin my part in this story of the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness. Maybe because my introduction to the AB Wilderness was born of wanderlust and not an agenda, it gave me a chance to be awed, to be drawn in, to pause and listen. Consequently, when I reflect on nearly 40 years on Absorca Beartooth Wilderness trails, I can still hear the voices that resonated with me back then. And I want to share what I hear. I was allowed the opportunity to offer four vignettes in this book, and they are products of this listening. I was fortunate to begin my wanderings in that wilderness when others were ending theirs. But isn't it always that way? Some are always beginning their stories while others are ending. That is, if you're listening. Beginning when I did, I had the chance to cross paths with those who made their living in the mountains, like the sheep men herding sheep in the high mountain basins. I took the time to ask them how it once was. I hear the voices of those who came before telling their stories against a campfire, backdrop, and a cup of coffee. You will find them in this celebratory book. Bernard also knew about longevity. He began working as what he called a mutton conductor in his mid-teens and left the mountains when he was 75. It took a while, but I discovered another cadence to the pace of the backcountry. It was inevitable. With all those years at the University in Biological Sciences, I couldn't help myself. I found stories in the lives of the creatures who this landscape supported. Discerning the patterns in nature became a preoccupation and a reason to stay. In truth, a reason to stay decades more. As the years went by, I noticed that in Hellroaring Buffalo and Slough Creek, the evidence of past beaver activity was abundant, but these animals were absent from where they belonged. I went back to the old timers, the sheepmen, outfitters, and game wardens, and they told me the beaver had been trapped out. Consequently, after the requested and requisite paperwork and discussion, I reintroduced beaver into the southern portion of the AB wilderness. I live trapped them with the help of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks as damaged complaint animals in the Gallatin and Paradise Valley and packed them in on mules to multiple release sites. And yes, Molly carried in her fair share. Then with the help of graduate students, we studied their effects on the waterways and riparian areas for several decades. One thing led to another. It seemed there was more of the story to tell, always more, more voices to be heard. As my PhD work for several more decades, I studied the moose that used the habitat beaver created. And there were wolverine, that roamed the adjacent boreal forests and high snowy mountains. So we studied their surreptitious ways and I learned about their far ranging movements. The stories of beaver, moose and wolverine and the AB wilderness are in this book too. I'm glad that this capstone book gives a voice to these silent ones as well. On my first trip into the Absorbica Beartooth wilderness in 1978, I had exactly what I wanted, a good horse and boundless good country to ride in. And a big roan mule named Molly was along too. She was a constant companion. She was there at the beginning and at the end. 
A small bit of her story is in this book as well. All these voices defined my voice. They beat like a metronome for my own existence. There's a richness to life that comes from having a good story to tell. That is a gift from the wilderness to me. Now in my reflections, I hear the voices I found in these mountains, and it is wonderful company. In a measure, telling their stories in this book is a gift back to them. But there's a larger truth in all of this. I learned that to tell a good story, you first have to love to listen. Listening is good for the soul and offers respect. It is a cadence for living. Listening can open the door to a world of beautiful voices. And it's my pleasure now to pause and introduce the last and concluding speaker, Shane Doyle. He is a Crow tribal member who grew up in Crow Agency, Montana. He now lives in Bozeman. Shane completed an appointment in genetics with the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and is now an educational and cultural consultant. He serves on several boards, including the Extreme History Project. Dr. Doyle was a founding member of the Montana Wilderness Association's Hold Our Ground campaign in 2017. He and his wife, are in the steering committee for the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation's Raising Places grants, focused on the community of lodgegrass. Shane focused his doctoral research on the Absorca Agency, where his great-great-grandparents were married at the foot of the Absorca Range in 1869. So he has a strong family tie to the Absorca Beartooth region. It's our pleasure to have you here, Shane. Thank you so much, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. And I just want to thank everyone else for being on today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take over the show here, as they say. Okay. Uh, well, again, I just want to thank everybody, Trouty, Jesse, uh, everyone at the Draper Museum. Um, it's been a great uh, privilege to be able to contribute with all these other amazing authors um, and uh, help to bring my perspective to the whole thing. So um, as Dan mentioned, uh, I'm kind of an academic and have been working in academia for a while. Um, I have a doctorate in curriculum instruction and uh, mostly have focused uh, my research on Northern Plains culture. And so uh, one of the uh, things I like to speak about is medicine wheel country and the AB wilderness area uh, is all, in that medicine wheel country, um, it's kind of at the heart of it. And uh, so this is a photo of the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, uh, which is located right around 10,000 feet up in the Bighorn Mountains. And from that spot there, you can you know just look to the west and see the the AB Wilderness, and uh, you know look to the north, you can see the Big Snowies, the Prior Mountains, um, and so just a great landscape. But uh, again, there's a photo, I believe that's right around sunrise. You can kind of see the, the uh, angle of the shadows there on the medicine wheel. Uh, here's a photo, uh, a satellite image. Of, again, the medicine wheel country and AB is right in there. Um, you can see all that area just to the east of it is just a dry basin there in the Bighorn area. And then everything south, of course, is well watered and rich. It's the Yellowstone park, it's the Teton area. Um, and so uh, very important place on the map and how the AB wilderness fits into Plains Indian culture and Crow culture is one of the things I wanted to speak about today. Uh, from the research that I've done, as Dan mentioned, I've uh, worked with um, some geneticists in Denmark and uh, they did a study on a 12,600 year old boy that was found within eye view of the AB wilderness area over in the Shields Valley. And that study revealed that the boy was uh, Native American uh, and that uh, American Indians are Aboriginal, are the original people of the continent um, and have been here for well over 13,000 years. Of course, that image there is from uh, 
colonial time when they had horses. Uh, I've also been fortunate to be involved with some uh, um, research up in the uh, the uh, Sarka Beartooth ice patches, some archaeology, and here's my friend uh, researcher Craig Lee, and what he's holding there is a 10,000 year old atlatl dart that was found in an ice patch uh, up in the up Sarka Beartooth, uh, not far from the highway actually, Highway 212, and so uh, pretty easily accessible. In fact, hikers trek across it all the time. Um, and there's a lot of the ice patches up there that are over 10,000 years old that uh, the public probably has no idea um, that they're walking across such ancient ice. Um, but from the research that we've done up there, we found that for every football field size area of ground, we find at least 30 um, artifacts on the ground. And so, uh, by all indications, Native people have been spending a lot of time up there on the high plateau country for the past 10,000 years. Um, spending seasons up there, unlikely that they would spend the winter. Um, but this is really a shocking development for most of the scientists. They had no idea. I think they uh, probably assumed that Native people really didn't go up into those high mountain areas. but. As it turns out, they were living up there uh, quite substantially for a long time. My tribe mentioned the Apsalaga Nation, Crow Nation. Uh, we came later on uh, in the migratory period, I guess you could say, uh, right around 400, 500 years ago is what our oral historians tell us. Here's a map that shows some of the different language families of groups that have come into the region, the plains, the northern plains area, and you can see the crow uh, at the tip of this green arrow here. And so we trace our language back to Siouan language all the way back to the Cahokan Mounds region. Um, and, and then we migrated up towards the Great Lakes area and then over into uh, finally into Montana about 500 years ago. Uh, as part of the Sundance, or as part of the uh, medicine wheel culture, uh, the Sundance is a, is a key element in all that. And so all of the groups that live in this area around the Apsara Kabertooth area all use the Sundance. And uh, the Sundance comes from the medicine wheel. Um, so that's part of the reason why I refer to the medicine wheel as both the scientific and a ceremonial uh, object ceremonial way of life out here on the northern plains. Um, people saw life as a spiritual endeavor. endeavor. Uh, they sought to build their spiritual capital through prayer and through ceremony, uh, through sacrifice and goodwill with their neighbors. Um, and they lived life in a circle. And so the circle, the medicine wheel, was not just a metaphor. It was actually really uh, a map for their way of life. And uh, they traveled circular in a seasonal fashion all year. Um, after spending uh, winters uh, in the winter campsites, they would travel throughout the summer. And this is how the sign language de was developed. Uh, it's the only universal uh, language really in the world. Uh, developed simultaneously by many different groups that had came from different linguistic backgrounds. And that's, again, part of the, the cultural history of the Absaraka Beartooth area and what makes Montana so special and important. Uh, Montana is unique and special because it has a combination of mountains and prairie. And in close proximity to one another, that is what allowed the Plains Indian way of life to, to really um, flourish because you need mountains to harvest uh, lodge poles. Um, you need mountains to access uh, fresh water, uh, wintering sites. Uh, mountains were used for ceremonial purposes. Uh, you know, the mountains were a key to their way of life. On the other hand, bison were so pivotal to uh, all of their resources. Um, that they couldn't be far from them at any given point in time. And so having the prairie and the mountains uh, right next to each other is what allowed the Plains Indians here in Montana uh, to live a pretty wealthy and healthy life. So here was the first uh, treaty, 1850, and you can see 
uh, the outline for the Crow Indian Reservation there. That's the Yellowstone River that's going through there, um, that line within the boundaries of that uh, negotiated reservation back in 1850 at Fort Laramie. Um, this, uh, this little line over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but this is the Shields River. Um, and I believe this is the uh, sweet grass or the Big Timber Creek coming from the Crazy Mountains. And so this was the original Crow Indian Reservation. This is what it looks like today. Um, and uh, obviously a, a quite a bit different than it was back then. The man here holding the ax uh, on the left, these, these are gentlemen who are uh, part of the uh, leadership of the Crow Nation back in the 1860s. And the guy uh, second to the left there, his name is sits in the middle of the land. And he was the head representative for the nation at the both treaty negotiations in 1851 and 1868. This photo was actually taken at Fort Parker right along the Yellowstone River uh, by William Henry Jackson uh, back in 1871 when that uh, the expedition he was on was about to explore Yellowstone Park. Uh, of course, we know there was a second treaty, 1868. Here's a photo of that. This is what the map looked like after the 1868 treaty. So even uh, though the crows lost all the land here down in Wyoming and everything north of the Yellowstone River, they still maintain the, what's now known as the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness Area on their reservation. So uh, that wilderness area there was part of the Crow Reservation and not just one, but two separate treaties. Now this is a negotiation uh, committee uh, back in 1882. The photo was taken in Washington, DC and some historic members there uh, including uh, Clinicus, uh, Medicine Crow, Pretty Eagle. Um, this is Long Elk. Oh, I can't remember this guy. I think that was Old Crow. Okay, here's the photo of uh, the uh, Fort Parker. This is where my great great grandparents were married, as I mentioned. Um, I think in the uh, introduction it said 1869, but I believe it was 1871. Um, they were married right down here is where the fort was. And this is Interstate 90. Uh, this mountain here the, uh, is known today as Sheep Mountain, but all of the tribes, all the nations of the area called it Hide Scraper Mountain. And uh, for the Salish people, the Yellowstone River was known as the Hide Scraper River uh, because of this landform here. This is a photo of my great great grandparents. This is uh, Sarah. Uh, her born name was uh, Strikes the Gun. She was born on the Muscle Shell River back when that was part of the Crow Indian Reservation. Uh, she married my great great grandfather, Tom, uh, Tom Shane here, an Irishman, uh, and they had seven children. They raised them at the Stillwater River on present day Columbus, where they had land allotments. And um, then she, uh, she moved again and she was buried in, on the Little Bighorn River in 1932. Here's a photo of her with one of her grandchildren. I think that might be John Hecken Lively. Here's her death certificate. I just put that in there because, um, again, her life kind of followed the boundaries of the Crow Indian Reservation. So she was born on the Muscle Shell. Uh, she was married at Fort Parker. She raised her children in Columbus, and then she died on the Little Bighorn River. And, and as her, she moved, the reservation shrank along with her movement. Oops. And I think that's it. I made it. Thank you. Uh, for those of you watching online, I believe I am. There we go. Let's get there. Um, you can submit questions using either Zoom's uh, chat feature or the Q&A feature below. Uh, we are putting uh, another link to um, purchase a signed copy of uh, the uh, Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone. Follow that link and it will take you to this page here, uh, Point to West Market, 
where you can purchase a copy of this 338 page uh, text. Um, again, uh, I want to, I'm going to flip back here. Um, but so if you haven't done so already, please go follow the link in the chat box and pick up your signed copy. Um, so at this point as well, you know, please again use the Q&A feature or the Zoom webinar chat to submit questions. Um, to get things started, uh, I just wanted to throw out uh, to, uh, to Trouty and Jesse. Um, I was just up in, uh, in the uh, wilderness uh, this past weekend. Uh, we trekked up to Little Goose Lake, camped there, and then we went into uh, to explore Grasshopper Glacier. And you follow that drainage uh, a couple, a little ways back, a couple more miles back and you can jet east and access Hidden Glacier. And we actually went out there looking for uh, the Rocky Mountain locusts, these specimens. Um, we found a ton of contemporary uh, grasshoppers on the glacier as well, and several decayed specimens. Um, and it really just, it's incredibly impressive when you get back there to see the vastness of this landscape. Um, we do have our first question in coming from uh, John. John asks, how much of this narrative of people in natural history is impacted by the Absorc Baratooth Wilderness being inaccessible for large parts of the winter. So thank you, John, for the question. Let's see. And then uh, panelists can see that question as well in the uh, chat feature. So I mean, I'll take, asks, a, I'll take a stab at it, but honestly, I think Jesse should finish that up because um, what we have seen, you know, in the past, and maybe Shane can address how Native Americans used the mountains in the past. Um, and it was considered fairly inaccessible. Um, you know, Dan would tell you when people would start going up into the mountains to trap beavers, etc. cetera. Um, but these days, I'm not sure the mountains are considered as inaccessible as people have used um, uh, snow machines to get very near the boundaries um, near Cook City on the south end. But also there's, um, this boom in winter recreation um, with people skiing into the wilderness, um, the back country all over the place. And so it's not as inaccessible as it maybe once was in the past. Yeah, I'd uh, add, you know, the uh, uh, Trouty is exactly right, both about the accessibility and modern technology uh, that allows that, meaning snow machines, but the beauty of the wilderness is snow machines aren't allowed. So, you know, the, uh, it's just wonderful to have these resources where you can step back and move at your own pace and your own way uh, on modern skis, which again, really increase the accessibility uh, to these areas. So, you know, I, uh, I spent a pretty good portion of my uh, winners helping people assess these uh, areas and we'll put in a plug for Yellowstone ski tours. Uh, but, uh, you know, winter is a magic time, a uh, magic time in the wilderness and uh, it's, it is a great time to visit. And you also, I mean, we're talking about it from the human perspective, but the question yeah. was about the natural history. Oh. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the animals and plants that we feature in the book actually kind of addresses how their winter ad adaptations, so. Yeah, Wolverine are, you know, the classic case in point that are dependent on uh, winter, uh, and it's a really scary situation with uh, the loss of particularly spring snow for Wolverine, and Dan could sure speak to that one. We, we in, in our long-term studies of wolverine in the area, we de determined that the wolverine that use that are connected throughout southwest Montana into Idaho and Wyoming, and in even populations in Colorado. So they are far ranging, but in indeed because they generally are associated with high elevation snow fields, the warmer climates and the retreat of those integral snow fields makes the habitat less suitable. So there's concern about the, the long-term sustainability of wolverine populations. But in our landscape in the Intermountain West, the Absorca Beartooth is ideal wolverine habitat. So I have a question to throw out to the panelists. Um, the, the wilderness is really an excellent place 
to study the indirect impacts of people um, being being more remote. We know they are increasingly being accessed as people are seeking refuge in nature. Um, but there's the lack of development, the lack of motorized and mechanized uh, equipment in these landscapes make them a ripe landscape to monitor change. So from the past few hundred years to looking ahead to the next few hundred years, how do you envision this landscape being impacted by how we're utilizing the surrounding landscapes today? I'm gonna start on that. And I think, um, you know, like I said, Dan's the researcher. Um, but I think that's um, a genuine concern that I, as a former district ranger, have. Um, you know, wilderness management is not just, um, <laughs> you know, putting a sign at the edge of the boundary and saying, you know, people aren't here on a daily basis, so everything is fine. Um, you can't just draw a boundary around it and, and then be complacent. Uh, there is a potential that what happens on the outside of the wilderness, um, you know, can <laughs> there's risks associated with what we do outside wilderness to the resources that use wilderness. As I said, it's a holistic system. I think the, the message that I would convey is what I tried to convey on that one slide is that just people need to be aware and more conscious of the potential impacts that we're having as we enter the wilderness areas and not just designated wilderness, but wild lands, public lands, and just approach it with respect and reverence and teach that to the next generation. Um, that's the best answer I have, I think, for that. Dan, do you want to talk about the future? A million acres is a large landscape, but in another context, it's just a postage stamp. It's, it is not an, an, an island. It's interconnected with the environment surrounding. So uh, factors that affect throughout the Intermountain West will similarly have an impact on the Absorca Beartooth. So you can, you can, as Trouty said, put a line around it. And indeed, you can limit the use of mechanized and motorized, which, which has a significant play on the, the circumstances, the construct of that environment. But it, it isn't isolated in space and time. And what we do under the human condition will inexorably have an impact on places like the Absorca Beartooth and the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem in the shortest term. We have another question from Carla. She asks, would or did bison use any of the Absorca Beartooth wilderness? Dan. Oh boy, I think that would be a, a, a question for the archaeologists and uh, Shane having some connection with those that are doing the ice pack, ice patch archaeology might have an answer there, but as best I can remember from pre presentations I've seen others do, there have been bison remains found at those highest elevations as the ice pack and the, the ice shield fields retreat. So how much they made incursions up into the, uh, those big fjord-like drainages off the plains, I don't really know, but it, they wouldn't have uh, there was their access wouldn't have been restricted but i think when in other times when the climate was more uh, made the area more approachable there was use by bison in the high elevations you want to add to that chain with your knowledge of the ice patch archaeology yeah dan i think you nailed it and uh you know uh, bison have been going up there uh, for ten thousand years up to the high country um you know there's bones that are found up there people have been hunting them um, you know, that's not ideal area for them, but, uh, you know, they, they do get around and I, I don't think that, um, you know, it was something, as you mentioned, that was, uh, year in, year out, but, uh, it was probably something that, you know, during different epochs when things warmed up, um, you know, they would head up there for sure, but they, they were there they've always been there. And, and I would add, you know, being a wi winter resident of Cook City, that bison passed through Cook City headed up, uh, you know, up in that high country. Deep snow is, uh, they're a pretty strong, powerful animal they plow through. So even to this day, you know, they're very, they're on the edge for sure in winter even. So, yep. So a question for Jesse, um, what is it about, 
uh, cartography and working with uh, depicting these landscapes that really helped you tie together the stories um, from, from looking at topographical lines on a map um, to weaving that into a narrative uh, into the atlas. Um, how, how has that, uh, that process really helped you to, to put this story together? Well, you know, it's just, uh, maybe uh, I'll do uh, share a screen. And uh, I think that'll be uh, maybe an example. This is, this is from Shane's uh, uh, essay. And it's the, uh, you know, this is the uh, uh, a map as a part of it. But you see where the uh, treaty of the boundary of the 1851 treaty just, and oh, okay. uh, or is this going try to try to reshare your screen Jesse okay yeah. perfect mm -hmm. perfect you got it okay and uh, so this is the treaty Laramie uh, Fort Laramie 1851 boundary uh, it was reduced in the 1868 treaty as Shane pointed out further reduced uh, in 82, in uh, 91, and finally down to the present. So, we, you know, you see a map, you're able to uh, set things up, uh, see how they fit on the landscape and just what the expense, you know, the, uh, the extent of the areas that Shane refers to in his essay. And I think, you know, some people have, uh, better ability to translate maps into landscape. Uh, for me, maps are fascinating. They're both uh, a walk down memory lane. You remember places you went and what you did, and also a wish book. You look to the future and say, wow, that'd be a, a fascinating place to explore. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we actually have a, a question from the audience here. Nathan here is going to unmute Kathy. Um, okay. Kathy Burke has a question that she would like to ask the panelists. We have a moment to, uh, to work with the Zoom technology. I'm trying to do this on my smartphone and I accidentally hit the button. So I don't have a question, but have been appreciating the presentation. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Kathy. A question for, uh, for Dan, Shane, Trouty, and Jesse. Is there anything else that you'd like folks here to know about either the book or what the wilderness area means to you? Um, anything else that you'd like to share or like the online audience here to know? I'd answer that, Corey. This is Trouty. Can you hear me? Yep. I want to put a shout out actually to the foundation. Um, we haven't talked very much about them today. And I'm not actually um, a staff member of the foundation or even on the board. And I think that what they accomplish um, is kind of Herculean with considering um, they have a shoestring budget and an even shorter staff and they get people out on the ground and they inspire people. Um, they do a lot to create connection and help our stewardship efforts out there. Um, so I do want to just recognize the foundation as well. Fantastic. I'm going to share the screen here real quick um, for a closeout. And if this happens properly, you should now see the, the outro screen here. Um, to Trouty, Jesse, Dan, and Shane, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to visit with us and share a little teaser from Voices of Yellowstone's Capstone. Um, also, again, a big thank you to our sponsors for the Lunchtime Expedition Speaker Series. Uh, this pres presentation is recorded and will be uploaded either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So if you missed anything from today's presentation or you want to hear anything again, um, you'll be able to find that link. It will be emailed out to the listserv, which to be added to the listserv, just email that email address on the screen. Um, and it will also be posted to our Facebook uh, YouTube channel or our Facebook page. Um, 
So it's been a pleasure speaking with you all. Again, you can access, you can purchase a signed copy of this book. Uh, just look in the chat window there for the link to the book, and that will take you to the Points West Market to purchase a signed copy. Um, it has been a pleasure speaking with you all. And for those of you online, um, again, we'll be sending out a recording shortly. So thank you all, and uh, please do take care, and we hope to see you again soon. Hopefully to see you all in person soon for in-person presentations. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Corey thank you. and Nathan. Been a pleasure. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Likewise, and thank you for all joining us online. We'll see you soon.